Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the wit people witness the thunder and the lightning, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. They were afraid and trembled and stood in a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 19. Let's read it together. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. 
Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then I shall be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The Letter of St. Paul to the Philippians If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as a loss because of Christ. For in that I regard everything a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, 
Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was in architecture school, I was assigned a job as a teaching assistant for a real estate development class. Now, I had never studied real estate development. I knew nothing about real estate development, but by a weird quirk in that university, the real estate development program was part of the division of urban planning, which was in the School of Architecture rather than the School of Business. So I was assigned to real estate development. The instructor was a retired New York City land developer, and he had made a fortune with a system of prefabricated apartment blocks, and taken his fortune and spent his winters in Palm Beach. He flew one day a week back to New York to teach this class, and then flew back again that evening. He taught the same class for many years with the same handouts, the same overhead transparencies, the same exams. He didn't really need a TA as much as he needed a personal assistant for his trips to New York, someone to run errands, someone to return phone calls, someone to take care of paperwork for him. And so it was that I found myself one spring afternoon standing on the corner of 116th Street and Amsterdam Avenue in Manhattan to pick up the professor's Porsche. He had someone else drive it up from Palm Beach for the summer, and he needed me to accept delivery of it and put it in the garage for him. So I'm standing there, and this guy pulls up to the curb in this beautiful, beautiful Porsche 911. He says, are you here to pick up John Peterson's car? I said, yes. He gives me a form to sign, hands me the keys, and he walks off toward the subway entrance. Now keep in mind that at this point, I was a fairly scruffy looking 23 year old with a long beard and a long ponytail. And even I found myself thinking, why would anybody trust me with their car? But here I am in Manhattan with this outrageous vehicle. My assignment was to drive it two blocks and put it in the faculty garage. Now, on the one hand, I was terrified. I was, I was sure I was going to scratch it, I was going to ding it, I was going to damage it in some way. But on the other hand, I was thinking to myself, who is going to know? If I decide to take a little whirl around Central Park, if I decide to take a trip across the George Washington Bridge, who is going to know? I had no illusion that the car was mine. I had no illusion that I had earned it or was going to get to keep it. But for two blocks, I was basking in the cool of that car. Now, ultimately, fear triumphed over imagination, and I did what I was supposed to and put the car away. But that is one of the images, the image of this fantastic car. is one of the images that comes to my mind when I think about being a steward, either a good steward or a bad steward. The car didn't belong to me. I had no illusion that the car belonged to me. I was just being asked to take care of it for a short time. I would have to account for my use of the car. I mean, the mileage was in the paperwork. I was not getting away with anything. I'd have to give the car back, but for the little while that I had it, I was just thrilled to have access to it, to be associated with it. And that's one of the ways that the parable of the wicked tenants that Jesus tells this morning is often interpreted. God not only owns the land, owns the vineyard, but God is the one who planted the vines. God is the one who built the infrastructure. This all belongs to God. 
God created this world that we live in, and God made it good for us to live in. God has given us everything that we need to bear fruit. God has given this world, this vineyard, into our care and expects fruit. God hasn't only given us responsibility for the earth, God has given us the law as a way to live together and to live with God in shalom, in peace, in plenty. And stewardship is what we do with everything for which we've been given responsibility. Furthermore, God has sent his servants, the prophets, and even God's son, Jesus, to remind us of our responsibilities to God and to one another, and to remind us of the law and what have we done? The people of God have ignored the word of God, they have abused the prophets, and they have ultimately killed God's son. And so the implication drawn from this story is that if we don't get our act together and start living the way God intends for us to live, God is going to throw us out and find someone else who will. Sometimes the story is even understood as a rejection of the Jewish people and the substitution of the Gentiles as God's chosen people. And frankly, that may very well have been what Matthew had in mind, but I have to wonder if that is what Jesus had in mind. One of my favorite interpreters of the parable, my professor Ron Allen, not the professor with the Porsche, says that it's, all, it's not always a good idea to assume that the king or the rich man or the landowner or the slave master in any parable is automatically the stand-in for God. And so I have to wonder if Jesus really meant for his hearers to assume that the landowner in this parable is supposed to be God. Because after all, this is an absentee landlord who lives in another country and only sends his agents around when the rent is due. This landowner is basically a real estate developer who's invested capital into this property and expects a good return on his investment. If we look closely, this is clearly a sharecropping system where the land belongs to the rich man and the tenants are expected to turn over the crops, the fruits that their labor has brought forth from the land. And so I have to wonder if Jesus was holding up sharecropping, tenant farming, as a model of the kingdom of God. It seems that Jesus is more often criticizing systems like this, systems that burden workers in debt, systems that value capital over labor, systems that keep the rich rich and the poor poor. Rather, it seems like the kingdom that Jesus preaches is about jubilee, about remembering that all the land, all of everything belongs to God and remembering that the purpose of the land is to provide plenty for all the people, not to make a few rich people even richer. And so I have to wonder if we're supposed to think that the Pharisees have given the right answer. After telling the story of the tenants' violent uprising against the landowner, Jesus asks, now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And the Pharisees, and the, and the Pharisees reply, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Now, at first glance, it may seem obvious that Jesus is saying that this is what God will do to the Jewish people or to any people, that God will punish them and reject them and find new people to live in the kingdom. But I'm not sure that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus never tells the Pharisees that they have the right idea, the right answer. Jesus doesn't say that the right answer to violence is more violence. Jesus doesn't say that when you have a revolt among your tenants, the right solution is to kill them and find more docile tenants. Jesus doesn't say that a solution to a system that exploits workers is more docile workers. More importantly, Jesus doesn't say that God will behave like an absentee landlord who is only interested in the rent. Yes, God has given us the law as a way to live in shalom, and we have twisted it to our own advantage. Yes, God sent the prophets to call us back to our covenant, and we have ignored them. 
Yes, God has sent his son, his only son, come to earth in the flesh to reconcile humanity to God, and we killed him. But what has God's response been to humanity's willfulness? Has it been to reject us and replace us with more docile subjects? No, of course not. God remains faithful to us even when we sin. So what does God say to the Pharisees? Jesus quotes scripture telling them that the rejected stone will become the cornerstone, that in the kingdom, expectations will be turned upside down. Jesus tells them the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. So who are the people who produce the fruits of the kingdom? Is it the developer who built the press and tower and then moved away to Palm Beach? Or is it the people who are working in the vineyard every day, tilling the soil, pruning the vines, doing the hard work of discipleship every day? Who are the true stewards of the kingdom of God? Is it the landlord who only seems interested in collecting the rent? Or is it the people who keep working in the kingdom, keep working for the kingdom, even as they recognize that this vineyard belongs to someone else? Elsewhere, in the Sermon on the Plain, who does Jesus say will inherit the kingdom of heaven? Is it those who drive Porsches and fly back and forth from their winter homes, or is it those who are poor in spirit? Will the ones who know how to break the back of a tenant strike inherit the kingdom? Or is it those who are persecuted for righteousness sake? Okay, before I go too far, I don't want anybody leaving here today saying that the point of Father Tim's sermon was to beat up your landlord and take over his property. But I do invite us to question our assumption that God is one who exercises his power through violence and uses that power to keep the poor under control. I do invite us to consider whether a system that exploits those who work the land in favor of those who own the land is really a model that Jesus would use for the kingdom of God. I do want to remind us that we are all tenants. We are all sharecroppers in a world we don't own whether we are literally tenants and workers or whether we are landowners and employers. I do want to remind us that we are all called to bear fruit, not as rent that we owe to God, not as dues that we owe to the church, not even as an obligation that we who are well off owe to the less fortunate. We are called to bear fruit as a natural product of our life with God. I do want to encourage us to think of ourselves as stewards, not just as of the wealth that God has entrusted us with, but stewards of the covenant that God has made with us, stewards of the church that God has ordained for his mission in the world. We are called to be stewards of the good news that God has shown us in Jesus Christ. We are called to be stewards of the very kingdom that God calls us into. Jesus has handed us the keys to the kingdom, but that doesn't mean that it belongs to us any more than the professor's Porsche belonged to me. But what we do with what we have been given tells us everything about our relationship with God and with one another. Amen. I invite you to join me in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for Justin, Michael, Peter, and all bishops. We pray for Tim, Mary Beth, Spencer, Willie, and all priests. We pray for Ed and for all deacons. We give thanks for the ministry to which you have called this parish, and this week we give thanks especially for the feeding ministry of Feed My Sheep. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray for our nation as we approach elections, that the will of your people may be conformed to your will, and that peace and justice may prevail in this land. We pray for all who serve in the armed forces of this and every nation, that they may return safely to their families. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray for victims of fire, storm, flood, and every disaster, and we ask that you give us the will to help those in need. We pray for the President and Mrs. Trump and for all who have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic that all may be returned to health and wholeness. We pray for those on our parish prayer list and those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, including Tom Shad, who was buried yesterday that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. And now we bring to you the hopes, the fears, and the thanksgivings of our hearts, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the peace of Christ be always with you. 
Good morning and welcome to St. Thomas Episcopal Church. A couple of quick reminders and announcements. Beginning next week, we will be doing our dry run live stream services in preparation for returning to in-person worship on October 25th. So worship will look a little different next week, actually quite a bit different next week. On the 18th of October, we are all invited to join with the entire diocese in uh, our convention Eucharist, which will be broadcast, uh, the details coming later. But the, uh, the presider will be our bishop, Peter Eaton, and the preacher will be the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the Most Reverend Michael Curry. So we will not want to miss that. That also means that on the 18th, there will not be a 1015 service coming from St. Thomas. All of us in the Diocese of Southeast Florida will be tuning in for the Convention Eucharist. I hope that you will stay for a few minutes in coffee hour. Uh, the, your stewardship committee, uh, interestingly enough, after this stewardship reading, your stewardship committee will be uh, opening up for us a, a new program of small groups where we can talk about the things that are important to us about St. Thomas and the things that we most want to preserve and our vision for St. Thomas going forward. And finally, you will have noticed that I was reading the Gospel and reading the Confession uh, and will be doing the dismissal at the end. Our, our good friend and dear deacon, uh, the Reverend Ed Hammett, has, uh, after consultation with the bishop, has announced that he is beginning his long-deserved retirement from his work as a deacon. He will still be with us. He will still be uh, joining us in the pew or on screen, but will no longer be, uh, uh, be doing the liturgical functions of his diaconate. So let's all be sure to wish Ed and Ginger well and thank him for a very long and fruitful tenancy in this vineyard. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God. forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love My king would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. King would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. King. You are my king. Ooh, yes, you are. 
We celebrate this memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Holy gifts for holy people. body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the power of salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ shares his body with us and calls us to be his body in the world. May we see his compassion through our eyes. May we bless his world with our hands. May we preach his gospel with our voice. May we love his children with our heart. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you now and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.